we're trying to build a little bit more intuition about um, quantum operations and the requirements for quantum operations. So in this particular set of slides, we're going to discuss something that's very important for quantum computing in general, this concept of reversibility. Um, but before we dive into the mathematics behind what makes a function reversible and uh, how you represent functions and, and prove that they're reversible, uh, we're just going to take a high level view and just really explore what that means. So let's have a little bit of a, a thought experiment that we'll start with. Um, so think about some marbles in a box. So we have quantum state that we're just going to kind of um, picture as a bunch of marbles that we're putting into a box. So in this box, we have red marbles and we have blue marbles. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and consider the a state of a single marble that we pull out of the box, a superposition of both red and blue. So we don't know the color of this marble until we take it out of the box and measurement so, or measure it. So here our measurement device will be our, our visual um, observation of the color of that ball. So we'll go ahead and put the cover over the box. We don't know um, what color we'll take out of the box. So we could have a blue marble. So we observe that the marble is blue. We can have a red marble. So we observe that the marble is red. Um, and of course, we have a relatively stable uh, state with these marbles sitting inside of, these, inside of this box. So how easy is it for the state to change the state of superposition? So the superposition, um, so we, we discussed how we have a, a uh, particular probability associated with the likelihood of observing one state over another. So that's relatively fixed in this, um, in this example, in this thought experiment of marbles contained within a box because the box is closed. So it's not easy for our, our state to change. Um, it's going to maintain a relatively stable state um, because we have all these marbles with, closed within the box. So our likelihood of observing either a red marble or a blue marble is going to be um, consistent. So let's think about another situation with the same type of experiment where we have marbles in a box, but this time we have a hole appear at the bottom of the box. So some marbles fall out. We don't exactly know what. And um, if we were to view this as a system where we couldn't observe the inner components, we wouldn't know what changed necessarily about our system. Um, so if we go back to the case here where we have our enclosed box, if the hole appeared within the box, we wouldn't know how our probabilities shifted. So in this case, we have the state of the system no longer stable. It can accidentally be changed. So we can give a, a term to this, this change, this unexpected change to quantum state. Um, so going back to, to quantum state, um, whenever it's physically realized, it's, it's incredibly fragile and it's um, susceptible to decoherence. Um, when we say decoherence, that's um, a name we call any sort of loss or modification to qubit state information. That's unintended. And um, that's caused by the, the quantum state interacting with its surroundings, whether that be in its environment or with other qubits um, in a way that we don't want it to. So an example of that, uh, of decoherence, would be a loss of information through heat dissipation. Um, so decoherence is caused by this interaction and it can um, vary in severity. So the interaction could be small to just cause a little bit of a difference in the, in the, in the state of the system, or it could be a large change in the state. So for example, I think a decoherence can cause a state of cat one to um, convert into a state of cat zero, or it can cause a superposition state created by the Hadamard operation, our H gate, um, to change from the positive um, superposition to one where we have this negative phase associated with it. Or decoherence can cause a superposition state to um, kind of move more towards a ket one or a ket zero. So these are just some examples. This is a non-all-inclusive list. Um, it, the severity of decoherence can vary um, in intensity, and the, that intensity uh, can um, collect over time over the course of an algorithm, and that determines on how easy or how difficult it is to correct. 
So we want to take quantum operations and um, make sure that whenever they transform quantum state, they do so in a lossless manner. We don't want any information lost by this um, uh, information transformation. So we have introduced this new um, requirement for quantum computations. Uh, quantum computations have to be reversible. Um, so we introduced this new concept called reversibility that's very important for quantum computations. And what does that mean exactly? It means that qubit information shouldn't be lost when transformed by an operation. So we don't want any sort of decoherence. We don't want to have our superimposed state um, somehow evolve into a mysterious state that we no longer know. So prior to measurement, any op quantum operation, and we've learned that our quantum operations uh, can be represented by a matrix U, uh, they are reversible. So that means that we can recover our input uh, using um, an output and the inverse of our function. So we can indicate the inverse of our function like this. So we have U negative one. Um, so this is no notation that's pretty common in linear algebra um, whenever you're, you're referring to an inverse of a matrix. We won't worry about the mathematics for now, um, but just keep in mind that when we're talking about a matrix U, uh, this symbol is used to represent its, its inverse. So for example, if we have a quantum state, so we'll have this quantum state uh, psi zero, if it's transformed by uh, our quantum information or our quantum gate U, we're going to get the state psi one. So if we get this transformation, we should be able to take this inverse, apply it to psi one and recover our original input, our psi zero. So let's go back and think about some of our uh, gates that we've learned about in lecture already. So consider the not operation and the swap, on, uh, the swap on operation. Are these reversible? Uh, so here, once again, we have our not operation. Uh, in this example, we are transforming a zero state, so ket zero to a ket one state. Um, and then here we have our swap our swap operation. We have a ket one and ket zero entering in the input terminals of the swap gate. And we see how the information is, is swapped between those qubits um, as it passes through the gate. So now we have a one on top and a zero on bottom. So let's see what happens if we take that output and send it back into the input of that not operation. So we have cat one passing through the not operation, we get a cat zero. If we have a zero one passing through the swap and swap gate, we get a one zero. So yes, not only are these gates reversible, you can use the gate themselves in order to invert their output to recover the input. So we took that output put it directly through the gate once again, and we're able to recover our original input. And that was the same for both the not gate and the swap operation. How about C not? Is a C not gate reversible? Well, we can look at our C not operation. So first let's just consider this as our, um, all of our input combinations when we look at our basis state. So we have zero, zero, we have zero, one, we have, um, one, zero, and one, one. So these are all of our possible input states and the produced output states. So let's see if we can map them back to um, the, let's see if we can map our inputs to outputs here. So let's note, we have four unique input combinations and four unique output combinations. Um, but whenever we, we look at the output combinations, we can see that if we send them back as inputs, we're able to recover our original inputs. So um, in these two cases, it's pretty easy because our inputs and outputs match. So whenever zero, zero is sent in through the C naught, we get zero, zero out. So of course, if we send that back in, we'll recover our same input state. If we have zero, one passing in through the C naught gate, we get a zero, one output. So this is the easy inverse case. So let's check these two cases where we have uh, an input and output that's different. Uh, so if we have a one zero passing through the C naught gate, we get an output of a one one. And then if we pass the one one in through the C naught gate, we get a one zero. So we can see once again, that C naught is not only reversible, it's its own inverse. 
Now let's try something a little bit trickier. So the H gate is our superposition gate and let's see if the same rules apply um, to its operation as well. So once again, we have our H gate. If we have a um, white ball passing through the H gate, so this re represents our state at zero, we get the superposition state without phase. Um, if we have a, a black ball passing through the H gate, we get a uh, superposition um, with phase associated with it. So this is our input of one, input of zero. And if we pass those outputs back through the input of our H gate, uh, so pass through passing in a uh, positive or a, um, a superposition state without any sort of phase aspect associated with it, we are able to get a um, white ball pass through the output of the H gate. Likewise, when we have a um, superposition state that has a negative phase associated with it, when that passes through the H gate, uh, we are able to get a black ball as the output of the um, gate. So we can see that with our outputs, uh, passing them back through the gate, we are able to recover our inputs. So the H gate is invertible and it's its own inverse as well. So uh, by taking the gate, having the um, state pass through twice, you get your original starting state. So an important thing to note, uh, whenever we think about reversibility, that still applies to states of superposition. We saw a little bit of that, we saw a little bit of that um, when we were looking at the um, H gate. Um, but let's think about that in a more general manner. So whenever we have a not gate, if we have a um, if we have a superimposed state with phase associated with it, we can see that we pass it through the not gate, and we still see that that inverting nature of of uh, recovering our original input state when we pass through the state when we pass through when we pass the state through um, the not gate twice. So let's look at that in more general terms. So here is our um, even superposition state with phase. And look, we're here, we're just gonna look at some arbitrary superpositions. So if we pass um, alpha or A cat zero plus B cat one into the not gate, that's gonna result in a state of B cat zero plus alpha cat one. So those probability amplitudes associated with our quantum state are going to be exchanged because of the not gate. So that's the not gates uh, functionality uh, on display right there. So if we take that output that we um, produced from the not gate and pass it back through the not operation, so beta or B cat zero plus A cat one, we'll see that exchange of information once again um, in the form of those probability amplitudes uh, changing um, or being exchanged and um, recovering that original input state. So we can see that once again, uh, we're able to recover uh, our original input um, by applying the, the not gate twice. Okay, great. Um, so reversibility, um, is a requirement for quantum computation, but this is pretty unique. It's one of the things that kind of makes uh, quantum computation a little bit different from classical computation uh, because classical computation is not inherently reversible. Uh, there are some uh, classical implementations operations that are reversible, um, but they're not. All, it, it's not a um, a rule that we have to follow like it is for quantum computing. So let's think of a, a couple examples. So the classical not gate, um, that is uh, basically equivalent to our not gate that we use in, in um, quantum computing, the classical not gate, that's reversible, um, but other operations are not reversible. So let's look at an example. So here we're gonna look at the logical and operation. And as a little refresher, uh, the classical and operation has two inputs and a single output. And any out and the out is one is achieved if and only if both inputs are equal to one. So let's look at that with um, in, in symbolic form with our um, information encoded as black and white balls. So here, if we have two inputs of zero and zero passing through an AND gate, zero and zero is going to result in zero. So if you have zero and one passing through our AND gate zero and one will also result in a zero. 
zero and one results in a zero as well. So if, if either of these inputs have a zero associated with them, we uh, end up with a zero. And then finally, our unique case where we have one and one enter in the AND gate to produce a uh, output of one. So this is a visualization, kind of a, um, a little showing the information in the truth table associated with the AND gate, uh, that the output is going to be one, if and only if both inputs are equal to one. So we said that a lot of classical gates are not reversible. Let's confirm this with the AND gate. So is AND reversible? Well, we just discussed how if we have um, an output uh, or an input of one and one, we get a uh, output of one. But in all other cases, we get an output of zero. So this makes it a little ambiguous. Uh, there's really only one case where we can guarantee and uh, with 100% certainty that we know the inputs. So to answer the question, the logical AND operation from classical computing is not reversible um, because in these three cases specifically, we are not able to uh, generate the inputs from the output. So let's look at that in a little bit more depth. So if we have one and one, we know that our output is going to be one. Uh, but if our output is zero, uh, we don't know for certainty what exactly these two inputs are going to be. It could be a zero and zero. Um, it could be a zero and one. We know uh, that one of these um, inputs will be white because that is the other three options we have for inputs for um, our AND operation. But we can't tell for certainty which one is or if they're both white. So. To be reversible, um, there's a couple of rules we have to follow for those functions. Um, so let's kind of take some observations that we made from um, the previous examples when we looked at not, when we looked at C not, when we looked at um, the H gate. For a gate to be reversible or for an operation uh, to be reversible, we need to make sure that all outputs have unique uh, combinations. And there has to be at least as many outputs as inputs. So what is reversible? Reversible in operations must have an equal number of inputs and outputs, but that's not strictly the only guideline we have to follow. So here uh, we're starting off with our uh, AND operation, or we're starting off with the operation with a single uh, input. So we're passing through the top argument and then we're passing through this bottom argument as well. And even though we have um, matching numbers of inputs and outputs, we don't have a truly reversible function here because we have the case where we have two input or two sets of outputs. Uh, so here and here that are identical. So this would not be an example of a reversible function. So as we saw, or to kind of summarize, um, we have three choices um, that have a white ball as a second output. So we tried to follow this step to make a reversible function, um, but it's we don't quite have one since e even though we have inputs that are all unique, uh, we have two cases where the outputs match. So in the next video, we're going to talk about, or in the next lecture, we're going to talk about um, techniques that we'll use to, to make functions that are not uh, inherently reversible, reversible. So let's go into a little bit of example of um, developing a function and seeing if it is reversible. So this is a arbitrary function called foo, and we've defined the inputs and outputs associated with foo. So let's go through them. So with zero, zero, we're going to have an output of um, zero, 01. With zero, 01, we're going to have an output of zero, 00. With one, zero, we're going to have an output of one, 1. And with one, 1, we're going to have an output of one, 0. So the notation or the, the convention I'm using uh, as a side note, whenever I'm listing the names of um, the qubits, very similar like we've, we've done back in class, but just as a refresher, uh, going from top down when combining those qubits. So zero, 00, 1, 0. Uh, when we list the qubits um, in a, a quantum circuit. 
So let's see if this is reversible. So first test that we have um, to kind of it, it is a, a good indicator. Uh, the first test that we have to see if it if it may be reversible is to check the inputs and outputs. And um, are there the same number of inputs and outputs? And are they unique? So we have four unique input combinations. So one, two, three, four. Um, we have two inputs in each of them, two outputs in all of them. And then we also have four unique output combinations. So, so far we're following the rules that indicate that this function may be reversible. So let's try out a little bit more, or let's, let's, let's investigate a little bit further to see if this, if this function foo is truly reversible. So given an output, uh, can we regenerate that input? So our output, uh, one, zero. Uh, if we send that back into foo, we get zero, one. Or sorry, we get one, one. And then if we send one, one back through foo, we get one, zero. So here we can confirm that foo is its own inverse and it is reversible. So to finalize, let's go ahead and um, make the matrix for foo. So here we have zero, zero, um, and that corresponds to zero, one. We have zero, one, um, and that corresponds to zero, zero, one, zero. So that will correspond to one, one, and one, one corresponding to one, zero. So here is the map, the mapping of inputs to outputs. And this is in um, Brockhead notation. So we need to take this information and convert it into matrix representation. So here we can fill in the rows. And we can see that if we have um, a input of zero, zero, that produces an output of 0, 1. So that corresponds with this first column. 0, 1, that produces an output of 0, 0. So that corresponds to the second column. 1, 0, that corresponds to the third column and produces an output of 1, 1. So here we go. And then 1, 1, corresponding to the output of 1, 0. And um, that corresponds to this last final column in the matrix. So we can make the matrix and we confirm that it is reversible and it's its own, it acts as its own inverse. So to summarize, um, reversibility, a very important concept in quantum computing because all quantum operations have to be reversible so that no information is lost. What does that mean? That means that the input can re be recovered from the output um, and that is done through the uh, inverse of a function. Um, so many of the functions we've described in class and we'll probably be sticking with uh, in this course are self-inverse. Um, and what that means is that you can take uh, a gate, you can use it consecutively, and then be able to recover your original input. Um, as a final note to take away, many operations from classical computing are not reversible. Uh, we'll kind of talk a little bit more about that. Um, in our next set of slides, we'll look at a function and uh, see that it's not inherently reversible and make some modifications in order to transform it into a reversible form. We'll also dive a little bit deeper into the mathematical meaning of reversibility as well. Um, and that will come in a, another uh, series of, of lecture slides.